Thank you so much for joining us early this morning. And I also want to thank JP, uh, who is actually beaming, beam, beaming in from New York. Um, it's an early night for him, but I'm really glad that he was able to actually sort of accommodate us to be here today. Yeah. Okay, so I'll introduce him a little bit more in detail in a few minutes. Uh, but before we do that, just give an introduction. This is uh, the third uh, luxury seminar that we organized this year. And, and this is in collaboration with LVMH. Uh, we've been associated with since 2014. So uh, JP has uh, come in about five years ago when he wrote the first book and it was incredibly well received. And so he actually came here, spoke at SMU and at LVMH Training Center. So anyway, so without much ado, let me actually sort of call on uh, Mabel. Mabel has been our collaborator at LVMH since we started in 2014. And I'll, I'll ask her to uh, join us and then I'll say a few words about, uh, about this luxury seminar series and today's talk. Yeah. Mabel? Okay, thank you, Professor Reddy. A warm welcome to everyone and thank you for joining. My name is Mabel Sin from the LVMH Learning and Development Team for Asia. We are delighted that there is very key, there's a lot of interest in today's topic from the LVMH community and also friends from the SMU network. The one hour will go by in a flash and we do hope you will participate actively through reflection and also in the Q&A. If you're joining us for the very first time, I would like to take the opportunity to share about LVMH. The LVMH group comprises 75 exceptional houses that create high quality products and experiences. We are the only group present in all five major sectors of the luxury market. Wines and spirits, fashion and leather goods, watches and jewelry, perfumes and cosmetics, and selective retailing. And I'm sure we all have our preferred or favorite brands. The LVMH SMU Asia Luxury Brand Research Initiative was established in 2014 with the mission to develop thought leadership on building luxury brands in Asia. We believe in continuous learning to gain new perspectives and today's webinar is one of which. I wish everyone a very fruitful time of learning and engagement. Thank you and back to you, Professor Reddy. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mabel, for that introduction, uh, highlighting the collaboration that we've had for, uh, for over six years now. Uh, quickly, um, with respect to JP, um, JP has been an old friend of ours. And so the, I actually wrote a little bit of a comment when he wrote the first book um, called Uber Brands, Rethinking Branding Secrets of Uber Brands. Uh, uh, JP has been with PNG for a long time in multiple countries, Germany, US, Singapore, Hong Kong, and, uh, and finally reached back into, into New York. But he's now a principal and a consultant uh, for a consulting firm called Uber Brands, uh, which essentially is actually a fascinating story. He'll probably relate a little bit more of that in the presentation. Um, the second is that he has actually now gotten more academic. Um, I think he's... Uh, He's now currently on faculties at Columbia Business School and Columbia University Business School and, and NYU Stern School of Business. Both are very dear to me because I graduated from Columbia Business School and I was my first job was at NYU Stern School. So anyways, way to go, JP. So um, now the third one I want to do is yeah, obviously he's, he's become a fantastic writer. I enjoyed uh, incredibly the, the book that he wrote first and now he has a new book which is scheduled to uh, be uh, launched in 2021 called Brand Elevation. And I think we're getting a preview of what, what, what would be in, in this book. And, and so uh, without much ado, let, let me actually invite JP to sort of proceed with this presentation. We're all, all really looking forward to the exciting uh, presentation today, JP. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for the invite. Um, it's always fantastic to come for... Um, a lecture at SMU or a guest talk and to work with LVMH. Actually, I put in a couple of LVMH examples, so I hope I get them right, as I said. Um, so not too much about myself. You just heard that. That's me actually in black and white. It's better than in reality, as you can see, as you age. Um, but uh, like Professor Srini said, it's important to know the background because it's through that lens, if you like, that I'm telling you about what I understand, what I've learned about brand elevation, how to create prestigious brand actually at, in any kind of category, at any kind of level. So my background is Procter & Gamble, mass business and mass marketing. A lot of the systems actually flowing into the management of any kind of brand being taken as kind of a standard of brand management but then also exclusive little brands like Fikai, which is a celebrity 
uh, hairstylist salon as well as retail business. I teach, we heard about that, and now I consult, which is fantastic because it opens me up to industries from um, watches to motor oil. And I'm not even kidding you, I'm just thinking about the last couple of months working with brands, which gives you a, a great span. Today, I want to talk about this hypothesis that I have as a base for what I'm going to present, which is that crises like the one that we're currently having can kind of be an acceleration of the future, can show us what the future is, or even more so dump us right into it. And the fact that we're all here on Zoom and that it's not a live meeting like last time is just one tiny bit of that pushing into the future. It took that crisis to make it happen so quickly and so broadly. And second, good brands, strong brands can harness those emerging social cultural forces that come to the fore in a crisis. And if they make it fit their DNA, they can elevate themselves and make themselves all the more stronger. And that's kind of what I want to show here, how you can use in a way the crisis as an opportunity to make your brand stronger or at this minimum, try to avoid that it dilutes your brand uh, and your business suffers. And of course, it's not only social cultural, of course, it's also technological and scientific advances. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But in this talk, I'm not going to focus so much on product, even though in the discussion, I'm very happy to open up on that. So the COVID crisis, how is it bringing us forward? Well, we see a big difference in how countries react and movements of trade and trends. Just um, in the introduction here, before we, we opened the meeting, we were talking about uh, at-home luxury shopping in China. Uh, trends are being kicked off by the crisis. Industries are emerging and growing. Who knew about Zoom a couple of months ago? Now it's an incredibly valuable company. Amazon is going through the roof, okay? Because it almost becomes the only way you shop right now, at least in the US. Um, E-sports, any e-entertainment, Netflix, etc. cetera. Uh, it's accelerating. And on other industries, you know, it's terrible, you know, for some hospitality, retail converts away, you know, buildings are transformed into apartments uh, and uh, into other venues, maybe offices, uh, rather than retail businesses, as we talk here in my place, New York City. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. There was a shortage of apartments, but definitely it is the crisis driving these trends. And that reminded me of actually that book, that Professor Srini was talking about, which really was a product of the last big crisis that I experienced. Of course, there were many other ones, SARS and so on, when I lived in Singapore actually was hitting, or the tsunami. But one that I was thinking about in the context of branding was the Great Recession of 2008. Um, and what we observed back then when I worked in uh, PNG strategy, was that the big brands, leaders of their categories, the kings and queens of their categories, like for example, Budweiser Beer, were losing and they were losing out to little brands like these craft beers. And we found this trend all over the place. And these little craft beers and the little organic toothpaste and the little niche products that were growing, luxury, bubbly, mineral water, were so counterintuitive to us as a mass manufacturer and marketer because it was actually more expensive. And how would that happen? This was the financial crisis. There were foreclosures, personal and private investment catastrophes. People were losing their homes. And of course, big brokers like Lehman Brothers and others went bankrupt. How could it be? Plus there was this movement by the quote unquote 99%, the disenfranchised, the people who were not participating uh, in the economic gain and who started to feel very exploited. They occupied Wall Street. They actually mocked brands, 
uh, like the Adbuster movement and said, brands are a sellout. We're, they, all the economy is about is trying to push things to us at exaggerated prices and exploit us. How in this environment could brands grow? In the art field, the same thing, you know. Uh, Andreas uh, uh, Gursky here with this photograph of the 99 uh, uh, cent store. Uh, unlimited choice, but you feel, you know, uh, caged in. And the choice is, is, is not something positive. It's not positive freedom. It seems to you like it's an oppressive, capitalistic, you know, choice that is being forced on you. And people were feeling that way. And that's, you can see that in the arts, you know, I shop, therefore I am mockingly, obviously criticizing that we were defining ourselves by consumption. So in, in, in this big crisis, what we saw as marketers was, wow, either people are shopping very cheap products. So they go away from Colgate and Crest, for example, here, when you're in uh, toothpaste and they go for the cheap store brands, but most notably, the very small, uh, like Marvis, for example, niche toothpaste from Italy uh, that are, you know, licorice flavored and cost three times as much as Colgate toothpaste. Those were the extremes that were growing. And that's where we asked ourselves, how come, how come these kind of brands, these little premium priced niche brands, or at least what we considered a niche because they even have mini in their name, like here uh, in, in this photograph, the, the, the mini car, how come they are growing in this kind of economic crisis and situation? And the long story short, because I already gave a lecture five years ago by now on the subject is, we called them Uber brands and we said, they are growing because they're able to create meaning beyond the material. They're able to make themselves bigger than a bottle of water, a handbag, um, a car, a circus, and they become meaningful. And that is what endears them to us. And that is what makes them feel, look, not like a commercial proposition, according to the old marketing rules, but something you wanna buy into rather than buy. And we had those rules of Uber branding and I won't go into them. If you want to know them, then please read my book. It's still for sale. Uh, and apparently it's a good book, we just heard. What I wanna focus is on is that these brands were using ideas but they were transforming them into ideals. And these ideals were uh, directed and oriented uh, and informed by what was going on. So for example, here you have Occupy Wall Street through the lens of a brand which is called Ben & Jerry's. When I was in Singapore, it was very popular and also very pricey. I remember in the Singapore Zoo, you know, a little Ben & Jerry's, um, had there, this is a brand that has always been about peace, love, and ice cream. Literally, that is their logo, peace, love, and ice cream. So it was just consequential that they would pick up on what disturbs the peace in this economic crisis. How is our DNA? How is our mission as a brand? How is our worldview as a brand informed by this crisis? What, how can we help? How can we do something about this crisis? And that's when they decided they are with the 99% and they handed out free ice cream scoops at the demonstration and they continued the fight. In 2000, uh, 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 I think this was six, right? Or eight uh, elections, they had an ice cream flavor called Yes Pecan. I don't know if that rings a bell to you in Asia as well, but there was a Yes We Can slogan by president or future to be president Obama. And so they could clearly sides also in the context of these social relations and improving social justice. So you can see here how this crisis led to brands embracing it out of their DNA. Another brand that is, has been doing fantastically during this time is selling not so cheap 
um, outerwear gear, you know, uh, I mean, in, in, in the end, there's tons of replacement for a Patagonia sweater. But of course, when you buy Patagonia, you are buying more than just a fleece sweater. You're buying into a whole philosophy about the environment, preserving it so everyone can benefit from it, um, you know, and trying to do your best to address the climate crisis as they actually call it out on their website. So you can see where this is coming from. And, you know, the luxury industry and kind of the, the, the peak of the prestige industry was also trying to adopt more or less. Um, here's an effort by uh, Tiffany's that started out a couple of years ago, which is to emphasize clean sourcing of diamonds and gems, clearly noticing this need, you know, to be environmentally conscious. I would say not as central maybe uh, an avenue as many other brands have taken, but nevertheless closely related to, to their business. So my hypothesis again is the best way to handle this crisis is to leverage it and integrate it into your brand elevation. And there are three elements of brand elevation that I want to talk about in terms of construction of brand elevation. And every time I'm going to show you how the crisis um, uh, is currently being dealt with by some brand in, 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 in a good way, I think. The first one is this dream and this mission that we just uh, talked about. The other one is the doing. Uh, and then finally, the dare, uh, daring, even though each one of these is important to be truly distinctive as an elevated brand. So it's not like daring is less important than the doing. On the other hand, if you don't act on your mission, for example, on your dream, then it's worthless as well. So all these three have the same positioning. Let me illustrate. Louis Vuitton, our guest here, at least part of the LVMH group, is all about life as a journey, the voyage, enjoying it, um, and contributing these uh, memorable pieces uh, on your voyage. Um, and uh, it, it, it has this fantastic campaign of making voyage, uh, le voyage epic, okay? Which one of my favorites was the start with Gorbachev driving by the wall, uh, which shows, you know, how significant and meaningful, again, this is all about meaningful, trips can be. We'll get back to that. It is a very big trend right now. People want to escape. It's all about experiences rather than owning. So what nicer thing to package up, if you like, a, a piece of luggage into a much bigger thing. Here is Burning Man, one of the most sought after festivals on earth, probably, for sure in the US. Everyone who is somebody wants to go there. OK, and it's all about exploring yourself, living out your fantasies, truly showing your creativity um, and, and letting it come to the fore. And it's very playing exclusivity because there's limited amounts of tickets. You, you need to show your creativity to get the early ones. And for the rest of us, you need to have quite a bit of money, actually, to buy your way into it. You can reserve early. If you're lacking in creativity, you have to pay for it. Very good kind of premium brand approach here to do this. Um, and it is behind closed doors. It only happens there on the playa. You're actually not supposed to take any pictures, which makes the few that are being taken even more rare. And this is also this inclusivity, exclusivity play that we see with premium brands. So again, Voyage taken in a very different way the expression of creativity. Here is Airbnb applying this, okay? This, this desire to be in a more meaningful environment than just a cheap room, uh, basically rented out by somebody who can't afford their rent and rented by somebody who can't afford the hotel. No, it's not like that at all. We elevate it and we say, this is about people who believe that people should belong anywhere. And it makes you belong anywhere and everywhere. When you come to Singapore and you stay in an Airbnb, you are not in some sterile hotel that could be anywhere, a Sheraton that might just as well be in Tokyo, Berlin, or Miami. You don't know when you wake up in the middle of the night because the rooms are all the same. 
you have a sense of belonging. How precious is that? And how is that helping this company going for probably what's going to be the most expensive IPO yet uh, for startups in the US? It is individual stories um, and it elevates traveling to the next higher level. So now we're in this crisis. How would these companies react? And the sad thing is that they don't look at their dream. They don't look at their mission. They don't look at the meaning that they've built up, but they send you some emails that empathize with you. And it happens so much here, at least in the US, I don't know about Singapore, that you know comics were written about it. Oh, there is some brand that I didn't even remember I ever engaged with who just sent me an email that they empathize with me and they think about me, okay? Not great. What did LVMH do? Quite surprisingly, the first thing I heard about LVMH actually into the crisis was they made hand sanitizers. And I thought, that's interesting. Interesting for a luxury brand. It seems a little bit risky to have hand sanitizers. That's a very utilitarian thing, etc. But important because empathetic. We're luxury, but we are not snobbish and arrogant. This is about lives here. We all need to pull together. So yes, we're transforming our perfume manufacturing to making hand sanitizers. But also very importantly, LVMH and Louis Vuitton brand in its journey didn't lose its journey, didn't lose the meaning of the journey, but thought about what do we do? Everyone's locked up at home. Journey seems meaningless while everyone is locked up and used very nicely this new environment that was actually forced on us of electronic communication to make Louis Vuitton go around the world and created um, Ablo as the, um, the designer here, Virgil, uh, this, this, this very uh, fantasy-full voyage, voyage from Paris of the comic characters that he creates actually out of the symbolism of Louis Vuitton, uh, the canvas, um, and sends them around the world with big containers. Um, and they go to Shanghai, they go to Tokyo, they travel, and then it's kind of mixed up with actual in-person shows. Um, and it becomes kind of a mixed fantasy reality, a beautiful trip. So here, is a very fast but very consistent DNA guided way of translating your meaning and expressing your meaning during a crisis. Airbnb, just that other example, they were stuck. Obviously, nobody was traveling in the US, one of the biggest Airbnb markets, but they had this engaged host and uh, 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 guest communities incredibly disappointed and came up with these online experiences on, okay, you can't come to France, you can't come to Napa Valley, let us do a virtual wine tasting together. Order your wine online, I'm gonna do it with you. I'm gonna do Photoshop with you. I'm gonna walk through Paris while you watch because you couldn't come over from the United States, etc. It became very popular and now it's a standing offer by this brand. So again, very much in line. And interestingly, even in the mass segment, even brands that were down and out <clears throat> recognized the moment, recognized this God sent activation for them and boring brands that everyone went away from like canned foods, Heinz beans or Campbell soups or ketchup used the moment and said, hey, we all know now comfort foods, food is important and picked up causes like in this case, for example, in the UK and US, supplying school lunches to children from poor families that only got their food in school. And since school was closed, they were going hungry. So they supplied millions of meals outside schools. I actually saw it just a few miles from my home being distributed. Here's the opportunity, okay? So they could build up a mission. The important thing is, is this gonna last after the crisis or are they gonna like 
in a typical mass marketing move, abandon it as just a campaign or contract it out to some agency and they just give money and the agency does whatever? Or will they be smart enough to integrate this and help elevate Heinz food again to something more meaningful? Because comfort food, soul, soul food should be more meaningful. And if it's not, then that was the problem. JP, so uh, Professor Srini, here's a natural break if you have a question. I was just going to ask you that. Yeah, so uh, I, I, have, uh, I have a question which comes in, uh, which essentially uh, deals with the brand elevation concept that, that you just talked about. Uh, the question is, can all brands elevate? Okay, and I think there's a sub, uh, subtext to this. Uh, the participant says, obviously it didn't do well for Mondelez, okay? So um, uh, no, I think the way that I'm, I'm interpreting it is, I, I think you, you've told a lot of success stories, Airbnb, just now Heinz and, and the others, um, but are there stories that we can learn from which are failures where they tried, but they didn't do well, and what are the lessons that one can learn? So I think that would be the spirit in yeah. which I would question, yeah. yeah. So absolutely, let me, let me give a quick answer. And then if we have time at the very end, I'm happy to get into much more detail. Can every brand elevate was the first answer. And I have to tell you, honestly, I have yet to come across a category or a brand or a product that would not be able to acquire more meaning. At the end, that is what brand elevation is all about. Are you a bunch of salt, water, toilet paper, whatever it is, or are there ways to make this salt more meaningful? And a way you can make salt more meaningful, which is a basic element, right? Is for example, by reminding you and collaborating with you on your gourmandise, on your connoisseurship as a chef, on your romanticism about certain locations, and you make it fleur de sel de la Garonde and it's hand packed and it's beautifully decorated and it's elevated. And this is a real story. And here you go, you have a salt that costs the pot for $29 where you know the average salt equivalent would cost maybe $2, okay? So the, more than 10 times, 10 and a, uh, you know, 15 times the price. So I think, yes, almost, I, I, I would have a hard time coming up with a product that cannot be elevated. Yes, it's a little bit more difficult with business to business, but I'm dealing a lot with that actually at the moment, insurance companies or tarmac makers or recycling companies that take trash and recycle it, even those can be elevated. Um, can brands fail at that? Oh, absolutely. There are more failures than there are successes for sure. I have gone probably by now through more than 500 of them. And I tell you, the majority are failures. Why? Because it mo the, the biggest reason is it doesn't come from within. It doesn't come from the brand's DNA. And the brand's DNA is not just the desired identity of the brand, Coca-Cola's happiness, but it is what is the organization really about? What is the manufacturing really about? Uh, how is the experience at the retail store? And does it all fit together? Is it really all consistent? Or once you take aside the curtain and look at what the actions actually are, you discover, oh, this is just a PR or an ad campaign that an ad agency has created. And as soon as the creatives get bored or the brand manager changes, it'll be something else because really the organization or anything else in its manifestation of the product or the service has nothing to do with it. That's when you have flops like an Audi jumping in to declare, I'm also for equal opportunity for women, which they did during the Super Bowl, just to be found out within seconds. They have no women on their board. They have no uh, a significant amount of women in top management. So who are you to just jump on that just for tactical reasons, okay? And so, yeah, there are many, many attempts to create meaning, to be meaningful in the moment, whether it's jumping on Black Lives Matter or on COVID-19, that are terrible failures. Um, you were talking about Mondelez. I'm not sure I know what exactly you're talking about, but one that I'm thinking about is when the US government shut down uh, about uh, two years ago now, um, Mondelez was having a store 
uh, where they handed out their products for free because of all the furloughed government employees that didn't get a paycheck. But the store was just their products. It had logos everywhere. People went out with bags with a big logo on it. And as soon as the cameras were gone, that store folded down, it was a pop-up. That's the kind of intervention that at best has a temporary impact, but at worst gets huge, uh, uh, um, huge protests. I don't have the right English word. Backlash is the word I was looking for on social media, for example. Yeah, okay. So, Debbie, I, one question we take, and I think this is a very thoughtful one. Um, you make um, me go over time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, but I think, we, we, yeah, uh, you can take the question and, and, uh, and see how much you want to uh, press on it. Otherwise, after that, yeah, you can say I'll defer it when I finish the talk. But I thought this is an interesting one, and it relates to something about LVMH. And I'm assuming one of the, one of the persons from LVMH has done it. He said, how does making hand sanitizers fit in the, with the LVMH's mission? Okay, so and, and this person defines what the mission is in terms yep. of being uh, most refined qualities of Western art do, yep. do good, uh, around the world. So what do you say to critics that argue, um, uh, that argue that this amounts to opportunities? Okay, I mean, you can be short on this yep. and then you might expand yep. on it. Later on. Yeah, I so, so I, you know, I put this in on purpose. I put this in almost to trigger this question or at least to trigger the thought. Because my reaction, as I said, when I showed it to you at first was, oh, that's interesting. I don't know how I should feel about that. Being a, a, a marketing person, being a brand strategy person, my immediate reaction was kind of cringing. Okay, wow, LVMH, plastic bottles, you saw them, kind of generic hand sanitizer. But then I saw the Voyage and I looked back at the hand sanitizer and said, good for them. You know why? Because if there is a criticism of pure luxury, high-end luxury, it is that it's taken to the level of arrogance and antisocial behavior. You know, luxury is okay that it can be afforded by everyone, that not everyone feels comfortable with it, etc. But it, when it gets to be condescending or even disregarding of life, then that's when it shows its bad part, right? It's darkness. And I think this was an excellent point to make um, that at the end, we're all humans and we make, of course, this human gesture, we can do it. I mean, there's alcohol available in these plants. That's what perfumes uh, is a key ingredient, right? It's, it's the majority of the ingredient. And there was a true catastrophic crisis in their own city around Anier and the workshop, people were dying and hospitals were overflowing. If in that situation, they would say, oh no, we need to plan our next fashion show. That would have been the bad thing. But it would also have been bad if they would then have started to sell Louis Vuitton hand sanitizer for $99, you know, in a chic leather. That would have been, um, that would have been the bad part. That would have been the arrogant part. That would have been the, the uh, I don't find the right uh, English word, but the, 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 the condescending part. So the good thing was to do this, make it a separate effort. It's clearly identified. It's called LVMH, not Louis Vuitton. It's not branded in that sense, but it's a human gesture of this brand. It shows heart and it shows sympathy uh, that I think was a great move was a great, it was one of the very first companies before the mass producers, before Procter & Gamble, even though Procter & Gamble has even more of the technology, Louis Vuitton was out there. I thought it was, it was great. Anyway. Thank you. All right. Sorry, yeah, so, uh, uh, so let's proceed with the rest of the talk. Yeah. I, I, I come to the daring. I come to the daring first. The daring is about provocation, is about what we are just talking about, that tension you want to keep up and we're probably the person who asked the question was worried about LVMH becoming too normal by having hand sanitizer and thus this tension being pulled apart. But my argument and the argument already in the previous book was, we need to make it a more acceptable tension. For example, the tension of uh, being in the know and being a connoisseur versus not, rather than just, oh, I'm all of gold and and precious material and you can't afford it. That in today's concept uh, context to many seems like 
a too cheap really way of elevating yourself. And in order to create this daring tension, the concept of defining and finding and talking to and celebrating your Uber target, your muse as a brand is extremely important. And that's why I'm going to repeat what I did five years ago, but very quickly. When I say, who is this? And I ask usually the audience, you know, is their favorite color black or red? Are they male or female? Do they have a beard or are they shaven? Do they have a gun or not? Are they smokers or non-smokers? And so on and so on. They, 99% around the world, every age, every geography, talk about that same person. It's a person. We believe in going our own way, no matter which way the rest of the world is going. We believe in bucking the system that's built. To it's a person that the company obviously has shown us, like in this film, you just got a little snippet of the tonality. But much more importantly, it's this fantasy person that's been going on forever and ever, the outlaw, the modern outlaw, the hell's angel, the Harley Davidson riders that are on the road forever. They are loud, they're tattooed, and they don't give a damn. And their significance is that the people who actually buy Harley Davidson, yes, they include some of these people. They might make up 10, call it 20% of people who buy a Harley, but really, really the full price expensive Harley buyers, what they have in common is they are doctors, they are lawyers, are middle-aged men mostly who have a midlife crisis and they aspire to be these outlaws, even if it's just for a short weekend, okay? And then they wash off the tattoo and it's over. And that is the difference between the Uber target, which is the dream, which is the dream that's being placated out there, the Dolce Gabbana Sicilian diva that's walking around, and the actual people who spend the money or who spritz on the perfume or who buy the Harley Davidson. And that is how you create this tension. You're part of it, but you're also a part. And it comes from a simple psychological uh, concept, which is we usually have several types of selves in ourselves. We have the real self, you know, it's JP, it's late at night, but he's engaged in this uh, talk. And that's the current situation. There's the worry state self, oh my God, Am I going to make it on time, etc.? It probably looks bad. The lighting is bad. And there's the ideal self. I'm doing this because I love to spread the gospel and to inspire people in their branding. And we're constantly going back and forth. But obviously, we like our ideal self. We might even have the fantasy self of being that queen diva or rocker or outlaw. And we have many of them. And that is what this concept of the uber target is playing on if you look at luxury brands in particular but any kind of prestigious brand they have this ideal self of you um, that you want to be and of course social media are perfect for that because we're playing the ideal selves all the time on that so to the extent that your brand can become part of the ideal self like here gucci changing room where you can pretend to wear this dress even though you cannot yet afford it you are helping these people to live this ideal self, but the tension is there. They can't afford it yet. It's just a snap. It's just for the second. So this positive tension, this attractiveness is there. Let me give you a different rider. These are bikers, but not motorcyclists. There's the Rafa brand in the UK. Uh, I do road cycling. These outfits are extremely more expensive than the average, two, three, four times the price. And it it's inspired by um, Simon here, Motram, the founder, who said, you know, I'm a middle-aged man, but, you know, I've been successful. I've got money. I don't want to look like crap when I'm biking. I want to be a gentleman biker. And he longed back to kind of the 50s inspired gentlemen's races of the Tour de France. Rafa was a team, actually, San Rafael team, very short, uh, not very successful successful but always very elegant and so he's creating this gentleman's cycling club 
And it's all very aspirational. And if you contrast it with actually cyclists like this bunch here hanging out, it looks nothing like it, okay? But it's the aspiration to be a gentleman in behavior, to be looking like a gentleman, to feel like a gentleman. And that, again, is this tension between the idealized Uber target, this gentleman biker, and reality. And if you put on some Rafa and it costs your fortune, at least in feeling and meaningfulness, you are a little bit there. Okay? So how do we, how does the daring survive during COVID? Okay? If you look at Airbnb, interestingly, they have these Uber targets. They have these strong advocates, okay, that want to be hosts because they say, um, the most interesting quote actually on their journey to defining that strategy was visiting hosts and them consistently saying, Airbnb for me is one way to bring the world to me, the fascinating cultures to me and be able to engage with them because I can't travel or I can't travel as much as I want to. And people going there said, for me, it's a great way to come to Pakistan on the bottom right there or to China or anywhere and be really part of it. And Airbnb was able during this crisis to harness these people and came up with all kinds of initiatives based on the enthusiasm and the energy of these people. So for example, some of their hosts said, okay, it's COVID, but I still have this apartment in New York. Actually, and now I moved out to the Hamptons to isolate and there are all these nurses coming in. How can I give my Airbnb apartment to essential workers to help the cause? And within a couple of days, they established this essential worker Airbnb system where if you could prove you're a nurse or you're another essential worker who had to move um, or needs to be isolated from the rest of your family so you don't risk to infect anyone, you get a free Airbnb apartment. And that was done together with their Uber target, with the most um, engaged parts uh, of their audience. And then they had other initiatives like the online experiences here. And they had also, from a functioning perspective, uh, monthly rentals. I don't want to go into detail. We, we can do that. But um, basically through their Uber target, creating um, uh, new endearment, new meeting, and even new sources of business. And everyone agrees that as soon as this IPO comes out, they're going to be the most valuable hospitality company and brand in the world, more than Marriott and Sheraton and Hilton and all the others combined, okay? What it is not, and this is important for the digital marketers, what it is not is hiring a bunch of influencers, okay? Hiring a bunch of influencers to talk about you, how you're great in the context of the COVID or any other crisis, okay? In fact, what I found funny is there were some influencers, particularly at the beginning of the crisis, who were like, I'm locked up at home. I'm bored because I can't hold up products anymore and unpack. It's not what it's on people's mind. And it kind of brought out how shallow a lot of these influencer tie-ins are versus true, exciting, uber-target collaboration. Okay, so the last part, again, there's none that is one is more important than the other, but without the doing, and as we've already through the questions established, the doing from the outside in and the inside out, so it needs to be both ways, all of this doesn't really work or is really short term. And I love Yuan, so I wanted to bring it up again. I know actually there are quite some fans in Singapore because they've got several stores where you have Huan Soap, which is a, a, a soap company from Taiwan. And what I like about them is that everything fits together. The story of the ad executive who had eczema, was totally stressed out, needed to retreat, quit his job, do Zen, and is basically reminded that his family and his culture um, has traditional Chinese medicine as a powerful tool to help him de-stress 
regulate his skin and get back to a normal life. And he learns about it. He learns about indigenous plants. He starts to plant them. It's in the Taiwan National Park. It's a beautiful place. I visited it and he brings his customers there. He employs former fishermen who've lost their job to become farmers. It's all handmade later in the quote unquote factory, which is really more like an atelier at uh, Louis Vuitton or Hermès, where it's hand formed. When you go to the store, you first are asked to do a tea ceremony just to calm down, get in the right mindset. And then just like a Chinese traditional doctor, they would walk you through your symptoms. They would explain the herbs you need that are actually outside in the garden of the store. This is the flagship store equivalent. And then they would give you a prescription of not only soap, but toothpaste and laundry detergent and detergent for your dog and shampoo and conditioner and you name it and some tea. And you walk out with $300 worth of household items that P&G would have sold you for 20% of the cost, okay? But here you see how the doing back through the DNA, bringing even the fields into the store, translating it through the story, the consultation, the tea is all mingling together for this very um, cultural manifestation. If you put it into the larger Chinese cultural framework, here's a fantastic way to be proud of 3000 years of tradition, but at the same time, feel very safe about the offering, which is often not the case in a Chinese branded context. You know, you're always like uh, worried about Chinese products, even within China. Here it's total transparency. It's pride in the provenance. It's basically a very classic elevated product. But when people ask me, why are there no Chinese luxury products? Well, this is how they're made, okay? This is a great example. It might not be ma you know, big, big luxury, but this is a, a prestigious household item. This is a premium proposition, and this is a very grounded, meaningful brand. A second example that I discovered during the crisis was this humble 200-year-old, one of the oldest brands in America brand called uh, King Arthur Flower. What can be more of a commodity than flour? Flour is almost flour, it's like sugar and salt. And you know, it's dirt cheap. I mean, you get huge bags of flour for like two bucks, it costs nothing. So here's a brand that says, okay, we cost a little bit more, but we're all about bringing us back to doing things with our hands, enabling ourselves to nourish ourselves, Bring this into the context of America. This is an American brand. It's completely opposite of fast food, delivery, everything, delivery, Uber, Uber delivery, everything. This is enabling people to nourish themselves, to develop recipes, to make their own bread, to make their own dough, which is almost the most fundamental thing when you think about nutrition and food. And it was like this before the crisis. And it did a wonderful job. It is, it is co-owned by just the workers. There are no shareholders. The workers own the store. It has three CEOs that have been around for 20, 30 years. Um, it is all about education. Uh, the, the biggest staff are their helpline where you can, you have your cake burning, you call them up or you text them and they will ask you, you know, and you can ask them how to save your cake, okay? This is the kind of company it is. And then it had the baking school and coffee, et cetera. <laughs> what are they doing during the crisis? During the crisis, they're like, everyone's locked up. Bread is actually running out just like toilet paper. So what are they putting up? They're putting up the insula insulation baking show where it's all about, okay, you have no idea about cooking. You would die in your own kitchen but let me teach you how to do this. And they do it in fun ways and wonderful ways. And they do it even with recipes if the flour is short, which started to happen, flour was running out as well. And so they, they do recipes with less flour and they do other things. Basically enormous amounts of people going to them. And you can see how this acquires meaning 
and in the end also does wonderful things for their business, okay? I mean, basically, they are growing out of the wazoo, but importantly, it's not short-term. They're growing as a brand. They're growing as a go-to place. They're growing as a friend that helps you, and their school is already booked out even though nobody can go there for the next year because now everyone wants to make a pilgrimage there just as they do for Ben and Jerry's. And just to finish, and these are the last two slides with Ben and Jerry's because we started with them, they also during the crisis put the doing where their mission is and they translated to very edgy, hard, taking a stand. They educate people about COVID. They explain that COVID is particularly bad among the colored population, brown and black, because these people have the least defenses, because they walk outside. They criticize openly what is happening. The CEO goes on television here calling out systematic racism and how combined with COVID, this leads to catastrophe. Um, they are putting in uh, initiatives to help shorten the incarceration because among uh, inmates, COVID is rampant and most inmates are actually from uh, uh, families of color. So in other words, they really, really put their action in their mouth where their mission is. So the doing and the dreaming is one and the same. And you can imagine that their Uber target is very much in favor. Um, proof of the pudding, they now have limited edition things like Pecan Resist, you saw that earlier, or Justice Remixed, and these limited editions sell out in no time, okay? So another example of doing all three on a simple ice cream, but that is about peace, love, in addition to being an ice cream. All right, that brings me yeah. to Maybe. the end. Yeah. Thank you so much. Question. I have two questions, I'll pose them to you and then you can take either of them or both of them, but we'll wrap up in about two, three minutes, okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, the question is about B2B examples because a lot of the brilliant examples that you shared with us tend to be more B2C. Uh, any B2B examples that you can share? And the second question is, I think it's, it's, it's inevitable. Um, uh, can, how can you evaluate the return on this brand elevation investment? So as it, it, it participants say, it's tricky, right? So any thoughts on these two things, please? Yeah. Right, of course, wonderful. B2B, <clears throat> as I said in the answer to my earlier question, if there's any area where it's more difficult, it's B2B. However, I think that is just because B and B, uh, B2B is not really as brand strategy establishing a brand focused as brands that market to end consumers. And there are good reasons for that, but I think there's huge opportunity because if you think about it, B2B sales are often just as emotional, if not more emotional, than B2C. We always think, oh, B2B, if you sell a computer or you sell uh, 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 a train or a locomotive or uh, an engineered part or a software, you know, you go to the buyer on the other end and that's some corporate buyer who's just going to look at the price, the service, compare it, get three more quotes and that's it. But there's so much emotion in that. I mean, there is the career of the buyer involved, but believe it or not, there's a lot of um, personal sympathy uh, uh, involved as well. So there is huge opportunity for meaning and emotion as well. I'll give you two or three examples very quickly. One very quickly, um, I saw a case study which struck me from a locomotive maker and it was General Electric Locomotives. And General Electric Locomotives, um, there was the buyer, uh, sorry, yeah, the, the seller, sorry, of General Electric Motor lo Locomotives talking saying that with the new campaign by General Electric, um, for the first time ever, his buyers of locomotives seek out their stand at trade fairs and come with their children. What had happened? GE had a series of making technology human and give it a human face. 
And part of that for the locomotive division was to work with the Discovery Channel in making a series about how trains had played a very important part in the discovery and expansion of America, in adventure, in culture, and what fascinating machines they are, basically documenting how they're made, how sturdy they need to be, how long they're going, et cetera, et cetera. And it was fascinating for children, of course, and for some train aficionados. Think Uber Target, but in a B2B context. And what happened here is one industry client then uh, gave this testimonial of, for the first time, my children turned around to me and said, dad, don't you buy locomotives? And he said, yeah, why? And they were fascinated about it, made them feel better, et cetera, et cetera. All of that to tell you, you can bring emotion, you can bring storytelling, you can bring elevation and meaning into almost any brand. Because we have very little time, just a, a second example, paper. In this digital age, paper should be finished, right? And in fact, what you see in the paper industry is that paper prices get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper because people are printing less and less and less. Um, and it gets ever more boring and ever more concentrated, like in so many categories. And so I have this one company, and this is all in the, in the book. Actually, I'm talking about... Um, Mohawk paper in the brand elevation book. It's also on the website. Um, Mohawk paper said, okay, we're not gonna play the cheap paper game. Nobody can win there. We're gonna re-elevate it. We're gonna go back to our tradition. And they make the most varied papers. They make papers from recycled cloth, which is an old technology from recycled paper, from cotton. Um, they handcraft, uh, they have, for uh, different processes where they semi handcrafted, uh, but it, it can be very modern paper. In fact, they supply the biggest new uh, business card maker, Moo, M O O, uh, very hip among a lot of people with all specialty paper. And I said, so clearly, this is a brand elevation story. They've transformed uh, one of their old paper mills into a paper experience center and their R&D center that you can visit. Their catalog, actually I have it here. Their catalog is not a regular catalog. Their catalog, in this case, it's a philosophy book that showcases different papers and printing techniques, but every time has a new theme, a new format, and these quarterlies, as they are called, are different every time, different formats, different colors, different papers, and they have become collector's item, just like, you know, Louis Vuitton books or whatever. And this is a industrial paper manufacturer, okay? They sell 90% of their business is to printers. And, they, and I said, in this digital world, can you survive? And they said, you would be surprised. Our biggest customers are actually from Silicon Valley because they realize that if you do Facebook and Zoom all day long, there's nothing more surprising, indulging, and wonderful than to have a physical paper to smell and look and read and hear. And so we get a ton of business from them. And it comes through their education work and their beautiful manifestation of their product, which is a commodity, of course, industrial paper. Okay, just as two examples. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Mabel. Thank you, all the participants, for coming in early this morning yeah, and uh, spending time with us. And JP, thank you so much again. Right. Have a good time out there in Singapore. Stay safe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.